so many colleagues from the University of Arizona right here in DC and I'm delighted to welcome the people who are joining us remotely for this morning's session. We um, are opening uh, a week of events here this morning with um, a session on how college choice can affect career, preparing students for the workforce of the future. Uh, our moderator this morning is our own Casey Okidas, who is our uh, vice president uh, Provost for Enrollment Management, and uh, Casey and her team have done an extraordinary job of bringing fabulous students to the University of Arizona in recent years. Uh, we've just enrolled our largest class ever, and we're extremely proud of the fact that it's also our most diverse class ever. And I'm sure Casey will give you some more details on um, the nature of the students that we are bringing to the University of Arizona. But let me point out that 45% of them have uh, identified, self-identified uh, as uh, coming from non-white backgrounds, which just shows um, the tremendous expansion in the diversity of our students and our efforts to expand access to students, uh, both from the state of Arizona, but of course also across the United States and the world. We're um, uh, exceptionally proud also of the fact that it's an incredibly talented group of students that are joining us this <coughs> fall, which is not to say that the students who were already with us weren't talented, they were too. But the average GPA of the students coming in this year is 3.62, which is an extraordinary um, achievement. Um, I'm not going to take up more of this uh, time for this session because I know that we've got a packed agenda and I'm going to leave it to Casey to introduce our panelists and um, I will only just stop to say thank you to all of the panelists for joining us this morning and sharing their wisdom with us. I hope it's a thought provoking session um, and that we all go away with new thoughts and ideas to uh, incorporate into our work. Uh, thank you everybody and over to you Casey. Thank you Provost folks. Well, good morning everyone. It's so nice to see all of you here today in person and those of you that are joining us online. As uh, Provost folks mentioned, my name is Casey Urquidez. I serve as Vice President for Enrollment Management at the University of Arizona. And one of the things that I do in my work every day is talk with students and families about all the financial considerations that they have as they're making their college choice. And one of those uh, choices that they're looking at and really thinking about is the ROI. What is that return on investment and where will I go from here? Whether that be into a career or to graduate school. And so families are really thinking about that very early on. And so at the university, we've really positioned ourselves to have a very close relationship as part of enrollment management is our career development area. And so we're seeing lots of trends like that across the country, but we, we definitely see the, the purpose in having us closely aligned as families want to know what that ROI is gonna look like. And so today I'm really excited that we have an outstanding panel that is gonna chat with you about some of the research that they've done, the things that they've seen as we all work together to help our students find their fit at the best place for them. And hopefully that's the University of Arizona where we offer some great opportunities. So to, to kick things off, I'm going to have each of our panelists introduce themselves so you can see the caliber of our group and then we'll launch into some questions. So first off, I'll start with you, Brandon. Thanks, Casey. Um, and uh, first of all, congratulations to University of Arizona for this beautiful space. Um, I, I believe it was supposed to open in April of 2020. A little bit of a delay, but it's great to see it open. And uh, you guys roll out the red carpet uh, in incredible ways. The, I think the production team is six person and we've got four on the panel, <laughs> which is uh, an amazing red carpet to be welcomed with. But in any event, my name is Brandon Busty and I'm the Chief Partnership Officer and Global Head of Learn Work Innovation at Kaplan. Uh, and I'm also going to refer to some of the research that I led when I was at Gallup as Executive Director of Education and Workforce Development there. So pleasure to be with you all. 
Good morning, everyone. And yes, I would like to also say congratulations and thank you for having me in this beautiful space. Um, my name is Jess Howell, and I'm the Vice President of Research at the College Board. Um, I'm an economist by training, but I lead a, an interdisciplinary team of researchers that focus on a, a whole broad portfolio that spans everything from academic preparation for college and career all the way through to college application, admissions, affordability, um, degree completion, and um, uh, research on labor market and early career financial outcomes. And I'm looking forward to talking about some of that research today. Good morning. My name is Abram McAndrew, and I serve the university as Assistant Vice President for Access, Engagement, and Opportunity. And that means that I oversee uh, programs that help equity-deserving populations uh, from our K-12 uh, access the university and succeed there, and then also our student engagement and career development. So what do we do while students are with us to ensure that they have the preparation to complement the degree that will be uh, at the top of their resume, and how do we help them transition to their next uh, opportunity beyond the university? So glad to be with you this morning and uh, with my colleagues here. Thank you. Um, Marty Vanderwerf, um, good morning. Um, I work at the uh, Georgetown University Center on Education and the Workforce, where we do a lot of work about the ROI of um, higher education and um, the training that is needed to place people in the workforce, um, not only now, but in the future. Um, whenever I speak in front of a crowd from Arizona, I have to build up my own credibility. Um, um, I have to say my wife is a proud wildcat, um, graduated in journalism. Um, and um, uh, I'm from Arizona myself. I grew up in Phoenix, um, did not go to U of A. But um, um, now that I understand that the GPA is so high, I'm disappointed because I don't think my son's going to be attending U of A either. But, uh, <laughs> but um, uh, I'm looking forward to have this discussion. Um, I think it's really important that we all be talking about the ROI on college educations because it's becoming increasingly important. And I uh, look forward to the discussion this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. We are just so grateful to have your expertise all with us today. Well, Brandon, let's start with you a little and talk a little bit about your experience at Gallup and what you saw in terms of the student success, the outcomes, and how that really makes a difference with the, with the research you found. Yeah, one of the studies I had the, the pleasure of helping lead there is the largest uh, representative study of college graduates in U.S. history, tens of thousands of uh, graduates interviewed. And uh, the objective was to look at their long-term outcomes in career and life, uh, measuring things like workplace engagement, certainly factors like how much money they're making, right? Um, also well-being measures, the degree to which they were thriving across different dimensions. And then we were very interested in looking at the kinds of experiences those graduates had during college that might have relationships with those outcomes. And, um, you know, I won't go through the, you know, the you know, excruciatingly uh, fine-tuned details of it, but there's a couple really important things to point out. One, uh, the likelihood that a graduate ends up engaged in their work and thriving their well-being uh, makes no difference what type of institution they attended. Public, private, large, small, just sit on that for a quick second. Because there's a belief, right, that the more expensive university or the private residential smaller enrollment university might be delivering better on the college experience. Maybe, maybe not. According to this research, no difference by the type of institution a student graduated from. However, there were individual colleges and universities because of what they were doing, because of the intentionality of what they were focused on in the student experience that stood out from others. Right, but it wasn't by typology. So the key factors that were linked to the odds of being engaged in work later and thriving your well-being were things like saying you had a mentor during college who encouraged your goals and dreams, saying you had a professor who made you excited about learning, more broadly that you had professors who cared about you as a person. I take those three things and I call them a relationship-rich education. And the other three relate very much to work readiness and the topic of this panel. And they were things that I would put under the heading of work integrated learning. For example, I had a job or internship during college where I was able to apply what I was learning in the classroom, the critical linkage of those two things. By the way, if you had a paid job during college, no relationship with outcomes later. It was whether you had a work experience that was linked to what you were learning from an academic perspective. The other one was whether you worked on a long-term project that took a semester or more to complete. 
You might think most college graduates hit the mark on that. Less than a third of U.S. college graduates had a long-term project that took a semester or more to complete during college. Think about that one for a little bit. Um, and then the last one, this is the interesting one, especially as you're thinking about advising students. All of these are interesting for advising students and parents, but this last one is a really important nuance. It was they were extremely involved in an extracurricular activity organization. Not they had a long list of associations they were affiliated with, right? The pad the resume advice of, you know, I was involved in 17 different organizations. It was they were deeply, meaningfully involved in at least one of those. So my point about those six things I rattled off and these categories of relationship rich and work integrated learning are that those are the things that students need to seek out. Those are the things that universities and the faculty and staff that are, make them come to life uh, need to do more of. And if you look at our scorecard nationally, we've got nowhere to go but up. And what I say by that is less than a third had that work integrated learning experience, less than a third had a long-term project. By the way, the most important one of all six only two out of 10 say they had a mentor who encouraged their goals and dreams. But I'll tell you this, I've measured universities where that percentage is more than six in 10. So is there big variation in how individual institutions are performing? Definitely, but it's not by institutional typology, if that makes sense. Thank you, very important information. And I know April will share a little bit more about some of the things the university is trying to do to really hit on many of those topics to help our students progress and excel as they graduate from us. Let's move on to you, Jess, and talk a little bit about um, pre-college and some of the research that you've done for students as they're looking at and making their college choice and return on investment, all those kinds of things that families are thinking about and, and the, the changes maybe that we expect to see with, with COVID and how that's really kind of changed the thing, the market. So when I think about talking to students, families, um, the adults that advise students like school counselors, one of the pieces of advice that is broadly supported by um, the research is that students need to make a post-secondary choice where they are likely to complete something. That um, there are actually big differences across different universities, and in this case, across different types of universities in what the degree completion rates and the certificate completion rates are. And completing a degree is the thing that unlocks sort of the biggest rewards in the labor market. And of course, on surveys, that's the number one reason that um, most people are going to invest in higher education. So go somewhere where you're going to complete. Um, and for, for many students, that will mean keeping their options open and in some cases exploring institutions that they might think are, are, are too good for them in some ways, right? That they want to um, play it safe and have some safety schools and it's always going to be better, especially as you're just exploring schools and thinking about where to apply to keep as many doors open. Um, for some students who are torn between going into a four-year college experience or a two-year college experience, here the research is quite clear if the student's goal is that they eventually want to complete a four-year degree or get their bachelor's degree that um, the ability to start at a four-year college has a very strong positive effect on your ability to complete a degree compared to starting your, your learning at a two-year institution. And every researcher who works in this space will say that is not intended as a slam on community colleges or the breadth of um, wonderful programs that they offer. It's a reflection of the fact that for a BA aspiring student, um, the community college is still a, a more challenging path for most students to navigate than simply starting at the four-year college. And that, you know, that choice between a four-year and a two-year institution or a more expensive four-year institution is often a, a fraught one for many families. Um, families report on surveys uh, since the beginning of time, I think, that college affordability is one of their biggest concerns. And uh, during the pandemic, that has only intensified as people have become a little bit more conscious of maybe their own finances, maybe what, what they're actually getting for their money, particularly as some colleges were, were open predominantly online. And so the other thing I would simply note about the research is that um, there, there sometimes is an ethos around zero debt um, college being the goal. And most research finds that um, some debt is a really good investment. Depends a little bit on what you're getting for it, but that students shouldn't shy away from applying 
to colleges broadly, finding out what their actual financial aid packages look like before they shut down options, and uh, recognizing that they are investing in something that if they complete a certificate or a degree is very likely to pay off um, monetarily. And so um, the, I would love to come back, um, perhaps after Marty has got, gotten a chance to talk to the financial um, angle, because I think that's a real important one. Absolutely. Very, very important. And I know that that is the number one question that we're asked as students are making that choice. Um, they want to know that we have the academic program they want first, and then how can I afford this? And am I going to get that return on investment? Thank you. Marty, let's move to you now. And, um, you know, we, we see a lot of negative headlines out there. Is college worth it at all? You know, should we be going to college? What does this look like for me? So can you talk a little bit about uh, about that related to career aspects, uh, college choice, and also um, a little bit about that risk and reward that, that we've mentioned? Yeah, um, thank you. Um, and Jess, you made a lot of great points. Um, I, I agree with all with all of those. Um, you know, um, I, 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 first of all, it's weird to be on a panel again. Um, and so I, I haven't I've been sat with a group live um, in um, well almost two years, I mean, but you know about a year and a half. So I'm just getting my sea legs back, I guess. But um, it also occurs to me um, that even two years ago, um, it was unusual for a four year university to have a panel and really talk about the ROI of, of college. Um, you know, people associate the ROI, of course, with, you know, money. Um, and there ought to be a lot of returns on college, right? Um, you know, it ought to be somewhat social, somewhat emotional, um, somewhat financial, um, somewhat fit, somewhat um, <laughs> comfort. Um, but, you know, in the end, um, in a capitalist economy, we all need a job. We all need to be able to support ourselves. And so, as the price of college has gone up and as state support for higher education has gone down, um, just to give one example, um, price has become much more important. People are much more sensitive about it. And um, if you're going to pay a lot to go to college, you want to know what you're going to get out of it. So we have an increasing number of tools um, to begin to tell people what they are going to get out of it. And I think the college scorecard, which is something that um, we look at a lot, um, and, and if you're not looking at it, you ought to be. Um, it breaks down not only by institution, but now by, now by program, what the outcomes are going to be for students. And obviously, one size does not fit all, but to get a sense of the value of an institution and the program within an institution, it's definitely something that, we, that you want to be looking at, um, especially if you're advising students or if you're working at an institution um, and, you're, and people are going to be comparing your institution to others. It's important for you to know how your institution stacks up against others. Um, what we have found, and, and you know, I don't want to go into too long of a discourse here, but you know, one thing we have done in this country really well, and I'm going to build a little bit on what Jess said, one thing we have done extremely well in this country in the last 20 years is we've really increased our high school graduation rate. Um, we now have almost a 90% high school graduation rate in this country, which seemed almost unattainable, um, let's say, in the 90s. Um, we've seen especially large gains in our Black and Latino communities. Um, they have really, you know, come up. Um, and so what we're not doing really well, though, is getting those people into appropriate post-secondary placements. And um, it's hard to say this in front of an audience um, when I'm being um, sponsored by the University of Arizona, which is a fine four-year institution. But the other thing that we need to keep in mind for students is that going to a four-year institution is often a really good thing, but it's not the right thing for everybody. Um, and the right thing for some people to make a good living um, is to get an associate's degree or a certificate or a, or a license. Um, uh, they can be very lucrative um, and we need, we owe it to our students and their families to be talking about these options. Um, so um, we find, for example, in some of our research that um, a third of associate, well, an associate's degree can pay more than a third of, of all bachelor's degrees. So depending on what you get your degree in, it can be really lucrative and really pay off and it can be the right choice for that particular student. So I always like to talk about that a little bit and we can talk about it more. That's great. I think that is really important and something that we are 
uh, I think as a profession, really trying to focus on and help students to find that, that place. And we may not have all the answers because we are the four-year institution that we are, but being able to appropriately refer and not just try to recruit for the sake of recruitment, but really help students to find that, that right thing for them. And we, we need all of those positions and jobs out there. So it's a really important point. Thank you, Marty. Great. Well, Abra, you live this life every day and the work that you do and, and serving students. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, your perspectives on what you've heard so far as an expert in the field? Sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, a lot of great points have been raised and a lot to build on here. So I appreciate that. Um, and I really uh, uh, I appreciate what you're saying about um, uh, making sure, Jess and, and uh, Marty, that uh, students have multiple pathways, right? and that uh, when they enter a pathway, that there's some value for it in them, right? In terms of completion, that's really, really important. And so what do we do within our institutions to create fit and comfort for the students that we're attracting? That's a big piece of, of what it means to be uh, at the University of Arizona. And I'm looking at my colleagues over here uh, who represent our Hispanic serving initiatives um, as a Hispanic serving institution because they really keep us honest, keep us accountable, right? For making sure that we are adapting to serve the populations that, that access our institution and make sure that students get through um, to that completion and to that value. But, but I like to think about it, it's not an either or, right? Um, once, once a student's admitted, we have that responsibility um, to, to build something meaningful for their, their work life into their academic programs. So they need to find a program where, where they're, they're studying something that is of interest to them, um, where there is that fit that's mutual, right? We're fitting to them just as they're fitting to the program. Um, but then along the way, ensuring that students can't miss those experiences that Brandon was talking about that, that uh, return that value to a student, those, that work integrated learning and those relationships that are so important. And so uh, one of our initiatives at the University of Arizona that really has that um, uh, access component in mind, making sure that every student has that experience is the 100% engagement initiative where we work with academic departments and faculty to build into their curriculum those semester long projects where they might be engaging with our community partners um, and uh, involving students in, in working while they're in school on an authentic challenge that's facing an organization in our community and uh, investing strategically in those relationships. Uh, and then um, the internships, you know, we have discovered that uh, it's true for our institution as well. So, you know, we participated in the Gallup study and then we said, okay, let's look at, let's look really at, at our institution. And for students who complete an internship, they're twice as likely to, to leave us with an outcome that they say is a good job, right? Mm -hmm. That they're happy with, with where they're going. So that's really important. And we have to make sure that students don't miss having those experiences while they're with us. So that's what 100% engagement is about. And um, research experiences also are twice as likely for a student to continue on to graduate school, which is the goal of, of many of our students who come to an institution with the reputation that we have in the environment, in, um, in astronomy, in a number of other fields, business, management information systems, right? That's many of our students, that's their goal. And so we support them with that as well. And I appreciate our, our provost and our um, SVP of research making an investment in undergraduates to ensure that undergraduates can have those experiences as a part of their curriculum. So that's really important. Um, and on the relationship side, you know, we also um, ask one of those questions, right, uh, of our seniors in their survey, who, you know, who helped you, right? Did someone help you to, with your career goals? Did someone help you access experiential learning? Um, and we find that we have uh, almost eight in 10 of our students say yes. Right. And that's still not quite good enough. Right. We're looking at how do we reach that other 20 percent. Right. But but we're definitely, um, you know, making sure to keep an eye on that and creating programs that help build that uh, capacity and the understanding of the importance of it into our faculty and staff throughout the campus. Our career champions program does just that, brings faculty together to learn more about, you know, how important they are in the students um, engagement and success after. Their, uh, after they graduate and some strategies and support and um, they design an activity that they're going to build into their curriculum um, for academic advisors or faculty as well to make sure that students in their programs have that experience where they, they, they don't walk away from the program without saying, yes, somebody helped me <laughs> explore my goals. Somebody had that kind of relationship with me. So, so the, this research is really important in, in informing all of the, the work that we do. Absolutely. Thank you, Abra. Marty, let's jump back to you real quick and um, 
thinking about the types of questions that high school counselors have or prospective parents have, um, how can we help them to better understand just what we're, what we're trying to do in terms of career development and, and student success? So it's, it's not just about the um, where you go to school or the, the specific grades you get, but how you really take, take charge of your education by being a part of something bigger with the programs that we're offering. So about 80% of students that graduate from high school are going to try college at some point. Um, but if you think about it, only about 36% of working adults have a bachelor's degree. So there's a lot of people who go to college. Um, they, you know, things happen. They might get discouraged. They might have financial issues. Um, they might go to an institution where they didn't feel supported. They felt kind of lost in the shuffle. They got discouraged. Then they left. Um, what, so when I was talking earlier about how we've done a great job in this country of increasing our high school graduation rate, we have where we're falling short is, is, you know, actually taking people by the hand and, 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 and leading them into um, productive conversations and thoughts about what they might be able to do at the post-secondary level. Um, we have an assumption in a lot of places that, you know, and, and I, I live in um, suburban Montgomery County, just north of here in Maryland, where it's a very wealthy county, has a very high um, bachelor's degree rate. Um, there's a real expectation that everyone will basically go on to a, co a four-year college and get a bachelor's degree. But that is so unrep unrepresentative of the country. Um, there are so many places um, where there isn't that expectation, and there's not a lot. And, and, and students might not even know that um, they can a attain a bachelor's degree. They don't think that um, that's for them. Um, they don't think they're capable of doing it. Um, and what we really have a shortage of is, in this country is really good counseling. Really um, talking to people about what possibilities are. Okay, you may not be an engineer. Um, although I don't want to discourage anyone who would want to be, but did you know that you can work in related fields and get credentials that would allow you to work in a lab or to work in the healthcare industry? Um, a lot of people just don't know, even know where to start with that conversation. As they get to be 16, 17, 18, um, we really need to be having those kinds of conversations. We can't just assume that we know what the path is of everyone. We need to be out there actually engaging with people. And we're not doing a heck of a lot of that at the high school level. And then they get into college and they think, hey, this is all supposed to work. Um, and it just doesn't for some people. And, um, and I think that's where we really need to be focusing. I'd Thank love you. to piggyback Please for just do. a second, both on what Marty and Avery uh, just said about the K-12 space. Mm -hmm. So one of the other things that I think we could do, and, and in some places we do do a very um, good job, is exposing student to students to college content, college coursework, while they are still in high school, so that they, they have a leg up, whether that's through dual credit programs, through advanced placement programs and, and courses. Um, we, because the College Board um, sits on every uh, data for every AP exam um, ever, one of the things that we've been able to study is AP participants. And we see that students who are exposed to advanced placement, college level coursework, are much more likely to go to college um, than, than students just like them who are never exposed to, to advanced coursework like that. And that's true whether they score a one or a two on the AP exam, that that, that sort of boost in college going is true regardless of how you perform on the exam. It is something about the cultural experience of being in a college level course. And one of the things that is you know, also a piggyback from what you've been saying about mentorship and research is that that experience that we is underrepresented in college, according to surveys, um, that's something that we can also pull back and sort of seed in um, high schools. So again, I see students who participate in AP seminar, AP research courses. Um, those students are much more likely to go on to college and seek out those kinds of experiences that are being highlighted here as um, highly correlated with sort of having high satisfaction with college and of course later life outcomes. So I would absolutely advocate for pulling some of these things back into the high school experience and, and um, getting them to students there. Yeah, and I think, I mean, to, to kind of build on what both of you are saying, right, the things I'm most excited about are examples of the blurring of lines that I see in the building of bridges. So let's just talk about a few of those. Community college to four-year transfer programs, right? We have not made this easy. <laughs> 
we have put more resistance and barriers, right? Like, but you look at programs in Northern Virginia Community College to George Mason, right? Students in a certain program have a certain GPA. They are automatically admitted in the Mason program. They have built an amazingly, you know, resistance-free pathway there. This can be done, right? So there's that example of the resistance-free pathways between community college and university. We're seeing four-year universities in the last couple of years invest heavily in offering non-degree educational programs. So the idea that these institutions only confer degrees in the form of bachelor's degrees or master's degrees or PhDs or whatever they might be, that is now been entirely reconsidered by the big growth in certificate programs that universities are offering, industry recognized credentials that are being done there. It's a lot of the work I'm doing at Kaplan partnering with universities to offer industry recognized credentials. It's not an either or, as Abra mentioned, it's a both and. Why not leave with both? Why not leave with a degree and an in-demand, you know, skill set that employers are looking for? Um, you know, that's an example of it. And then look at all of what's happening with large employers. You can go to Walmart, Target, and Amazon, among many others, and get your bachelor's degree paid for entirely by those employers while you're working. Now, a lot of people think, geez, that's just a path for working adults. Guess what? Some of the fastest growth in those numbers are high school graduates taking jobs in those companies and getting their college degree paid for. Now, they're not going on campus. These are online degree programs, right? But if you don't think that's happening, right, guess again, right? There, there is just so I'm encouraged by all those examples because you've got, you know, employer driven education benefits programs that are increasing enrollments. Uh, you've got, you know, these uh, examples of high school to college pathway programs. We need it. This is a simple way to think about this. We need to think about it as a talent development pipeline. We have not created a pipeline. We've got escalators that just have drop offs, right, as opposed to connections to the next level or escalator or elevator or whatever it is. And so those are all things I'm very excited to see more of. Yeah, I, I was going to say, Brandon, I mean, that's a great example of the connection between community colleges and, and four-year institutions. Um, think about how many people just don't get trans, don't get credits that get transferred and how discouraging that must be to those students. Um, there's always this, been this creative tension, um, particularly at, at research universities and, and four-year institutions that are pretty selective, um, that, um, well... I looked at the coursework and I don't think it's really up to our standards and therefore we're not really going to accept these credits. And, and, and you can totally understand it from the university's perspective, but think about it from the student's perspective. Think about how discouraging that is and how many people leave college and never get to be what they want to be because of that one decision that was made. And when, when we talk about colleges being part of this career pipeline um, and talent pipeline, um, that's a real different mindset. It's, 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 it's something that um, colleges um, have to think about themselves being fully integrated with the K-12 system and with employers because um, you can't stand alone. Um, from, a, from, the, from the viewpoint of the general public, um, you're my ticket. How can I come in? How can we work together so I can punch that ticket? Um, Colleges, you know, I always say, need to learn to figure out ways to say yes rather than no. Um, and when they find a student who maybe, ah, that, this student is kind of on the borderline, how can I figure out a way to say yes to that student? That's excellent. I think one of the things that we really try to do is to look for ways to admit rather than ways to deny mm -hmm. and knowing that we can really serve that student. But we do need to have all those programs in place to make sure that we are you know, supporting them to the very best of our ability to help them thrive. So I think that's a really important point and something that we're really focused on as well. Avery, I think you had a comment. Yeah, well, uh, I really appreciate some of the, the ideas that you're bringing forward, Brandon. You know, uh, the university does have a partner with, with uh, employer benefit organizations, right? We are partners with, with some of those same um, employers that you mentioned, right? So that their employees can earn degrees at the University of Arizona through our partnerships. So uh, we're grateful for that, that we can serve a, a greater segment of our community through that, those programs. Um, and then, you know, this idea of, of both and, right? Credentials and a degree. I mean, it's, it's so fascinating, interesting, and I'm really looking forward to the partnership that we have a chance to build, right? To build a few of those credit degree programs, right? Into, into our curriculum. And I'm just wondering, you know, um, uh, 
how how you are approaching that right conversation with with faculty, um, you know, around um, the value uh, of that. Well, I'll just I'll say a couple yeah. of points because there's, we're looking at fresh research, and mm -hmm. so, some of this was actually published in Inside Higher Ed today. Uh, Kaplan is a sponsor of the Student Voice Project there, which is doing monthly surveys of college students and ask them about are they aware of their university offering you know, alternative credentials, not gonna surprise you, it was like 12% said they were aware of it. Uh, when asked, would they be interested in doing one? Uh, it was like 72% of students said, yes, I would, right? So there's some high interest in this. And by the way, those students who are saying that are pretty wise because when you survey employers and hiring managers, I'm gonna just boil this down in simple terms. What do they want? Yes, they want a broadly educated graduate. Right. I'm not going to use the term liberal arts because that terminology doesn't really compute anymore. But the fundamental value of the education is as relevant as ever before. So they want a broadly educated student. But here's the caveat who also comes with a specific industry recognized skill set. So they want the combination of those two things. And I'll give you an example of a research question we asked. We said, knowing nothing else about these, the, these graduates, who would you be most likely to hire? First one was uh, a, a graduate with a bachelor's degree in English. The second one was a bachelor's degree in cybersecurity. Obviously, cybersecurity, white hot field. The third was an English major with a designation in cybersecurity. Four times more likely to hire the English major with the designation in cybersecurity than the English major alone, and three times more likely than the cybersecurity bachelor's degree holder. If that doesn't tell you something really powerful and important about what we need to help unlock for students, I don't know what does. So great appetite among students for these industry recognized skills to be woven into the experience and for employers, right? Like that's the message they're sending. Hey, send me both. I want your broadly educated and the specifically skilled. And then for institutions, right, how could a student who has completed both of those things not feel that they were supported in their, their career goals, right? So that's what's in it for us, right, is that we get graduates who feel that, that we did a great job, right, of, of leading them to where they want to go um, and, and they're invested for, for life. And, you know, that's our, our wildcat for life philosophy, right? Um, and it's not, but it's not just about the, the job and the money, right? It's about, again, what you said earlier, I mean, college has a lot of, of returns on the investment, right? Better health, right? Longer life, right? All of these things. So whatever we can do to help our communities to complete, right, that degree and get their start, you know, that, that has dividends for the public as well um, as for intergenerational impact that, that it can have, you know, on a family. So. Great. Thank you. So knowing all of this and hearing all the, the research that we have, the information that, that's been shared today, where do we go next? What is that next step? How do we move forward as an institution? How do other institutions move forward so that we're making sure that we're supporting students to, to reach that level when they graduate? I think transparency and uh, data and information that is easy to access for all the students, families, people who advise them is really critical. Marty mentioned the College Scorecard, mm -hmm. which is a phenomenal resource to help students explore um, different post-secondary options that also includes some information, um, not just about the affordability, but about um, potential earnings. And so I think as colleges think about how to support students and families, through you know, making the decision to join a particular institution or follow a specific program or career path, um, it, it's an increasingly needed that students have access to data on what the wide range of programs mm -hmm. look like, what completion outcomes look like for those programs, um, and, and of course, what, what earning potential, satisfaction, all of that information. That's not really, when we talk about everything that the panel has mentioned today, that doesn't exist in one place. Mm -hmm. um, and right at the moment, uh, it, it, it really is institutions who probably sit on enough of that data to provide transparency. And so I think there could be some real institutional leadership. Um, just like you said, we're, we're having a conversation about ROI led by a four-year institution that maybe wouldn't have happened a few years ago. I think mm -hmm. there could be um, a step toward additional transparency around data. Yeah, I, I was going to say, too, when you look at the college scorecard, it, it, well, you know, a lot of the programs that, Avery, you're talking about, Brandon, you're talking about, that get students engaged, um, 
that's that's very important because a student who doesn't finish and and i know you talked about this earlier jess is going to be a much less successful student and so when you look at the uh, data in the college scorecard there is a pretty direct correlation between high graduation rates and high roi because actually when they do those surveys um, uh, of each institution they look at everyone who attended whether they graduated or not and so if you look at um uh let's say um uh, Wash U or something like that, and they've got a, I don't know, an 85, 90% graduation rate. Wash U is, of course, a really um, selective institution. It's going to probably have, you know, pretty good outcomes anyway. Um, but then if you start looking at some of the publics and you start looking at how high is their graduation rate, you're going to see a direct correlation between high graduation rates and high ROI. So all of these things kind of work together. Um, uh, getting students in getting them engaged. If they get engaged, they're more likely to finish. If they finish, they're more li likely to be successful and have a greater ROI. Because um, you know, the, the, the least successful college student is a student who goes to college, takes on a lot of debt, and then doesn't finish, then can't mm -hmm. find a job that allows them to pay off the debt. Um, that's yeah. the worst possible outcome. Yes. Yeah, debt without degree mm -hmm. is to be avoided, mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I think there, there's a couple of ways to look at it, right? What's the advice for uh, an individual student or say parent, guardian, advisor to that student? And then, you know, what's the institutional advice? And we, we've talked about these pieces, but, you know, go back to some of the insights. What I say to students a lot is, um, okay, uh, you have an opportunity to pick a lot of different courses. Now you have a major and there are certain classes that are required as part of the major, but for the most part, you have a lot of choice in the, in the classes and the professors you pick. And I always say, pick the professor, not the class when you have that opportunity. There is no website, by the way, that lists the greatest mentors on a college campus. Mm -hmm. But if you walk around on any campus and just start asking questions, if I did this at U of A, right, what are some of the most well-known professors? Who are the super mentors here? Names just start bubbling up really fast, right? It's not a secret, but it's also not published on the website. So ask around. If I hear Marty is this amazing professor of economics, right, like I'm gonna try and take a course with him regardless of, of what I do. Then, oh, by the way, look for classes that, that require a long-term project. A lot of students will run from those, not because they don't want to do the work. This was interesting insights from qualitative research I was involved in. They're not scared of the work. They don't want to get a bad grade. So they think the grade is of paramount importance, and grades do matter. I don't want to sit here and say they don't, but I'll give you a quick example. An employer would rather hire a B student with an internship experience than an A student without one, right? And if I can come into an interview and talk about one of the long-term projects I worked on as part of my class, that's a differentiator in really important ways, right? So, but here's the issue. Students are making these choices and in many cases with mom and dad's approval, yeah, you know, don't take that hard course because you've got to get a 4.0 or Google won't hire you, whatever that story is, right? Like we are very beholden to that story. So when it comes to the institutional level, this is all about intentionality and scale. And it's one of the things that I've been so impressed with the work that Abra is leading at the University of Arizona. She's thinking about both of those things. The institution is thinking about the intentionality of making it a priority to invest in the work readiness of students, right? And that means it has to be woven into the academic programming of the institution, right? It can't just be something that hangs out as a nice to have within the student affairs division or whatever the you know, organizational structure might be. Um, and then it's scale, right? So every university leader I've ever talked to, they all go, well, we do internships and we have this program. And you go, okay, great. What percent of your students are going through that or experiencing one? And then all of a sudden it gets real quiet, right? <laughs> like there usually isn't an answer. When they have one, it's not a percentage that you'd put on the website because it's not 98%. It's like 30, 22, or we have one program where everybody has one, but the rest of the students, it's like 8%, right? This is about intentionality and scale on the institutional side of the equation. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, 100%. That's where we're going. <laughs> 85 right now, but we're, we're going to get there. We're going to get yes. there. And, um, and we have an answer, right? And I, so I think, you know, uh, to, to, to Jess's point, look for an institution where they are trying to make that very transparent to students, right? Mm -hmm. Where to find these classes, right? Um, that, that everybody can access the mentorship, you know, making that as transparent as possible to students themselves is a really important part of the work that, that we are doing. 
Um, and then, you know, I get very excited for the future of thinking about these both and strategies that you've been talking about, both reaching back to K-12, right, to provide that exposure um, and allow students to be doing both and um, at the high school level and uh, looking forward for, for students who enroll in our university, how can we provide them both the, the quality, traditional undergraduate education and a work integrated experience. So, so I think that is the, the future, the, the both and, and, and being able to open our minds and, and not hold those things against each other, right? But think about how they, they go together uh, for every student. Excellent, very important. And I think that, you know, the parents, the students, they're very savvy. They're asking very important <laughs> questions that you're right. So many times when they ask those detailed questions, it does kind of go silent. So mm -hmm. I think there's a lot that we need to do to be more proactive, to help families really understand things early on um, and, and have that full information in front of them. Well, our, our time is running pretty quickly. So I want to give everyone a chance to really give some closing remarks and kind of hit on any points that we didn't get to talk about today related to our topic. So we'll just start down at the end with you, Marty, if you don't mind. Oh, okay. Um, well, I think Jess raised a great uh, point too about um, uh, transparency. Um, you know, uh, it seems like a little bit of the error is coming out of the U.S. news rankings. Um, you know, there's, there's an increasing amount of, of people kind of looking at other kinds of rankings and really trying to look at what's important in college. Um, and when I, and that's important to me only because the U.S. news rankings have dominated higher education for so long. Um, and they're based almost entirely on inputs. You know, who goes there, um, what kind of um, you know, volumes there are in the library, you know, that sort of thing. They're not based at all on outcomes. And so when I think about um, transparency and I think about tools like the College Scorecard, they're all about outcomes. And they really are answering some of the questions that students are asking and they rightfully should be asking. Um, it's great to be on this panel um, next to Abra, uh, it, 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 hearing you talk about um, all these things about engaging in these conversations with students about what's important. Colleges for a long time have run from those conversations. Um, and I think that, you know, colleges need to embrace those conversations. They need to be honest with, with their students about what the outcomes might be and what's important to, for them to do while they're in college. We've, you know, especially at a large institution um, like the University of Arizona, but many other schools, it's very easy for students to get lost. Um, and so to really be embracing the idea of these conversations and then having them is, and, and talking about what outcomes might be, talking with them in dollars and cents, talking with them about other outcomes like, you know, health outcomes, career mobility, that sort of thing. Very, very important to have those kinds of conversations. Yeah. Thank you. We'll go to you, Abraham. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate what you're saying. Um, I think that uh, it's important to acknowledge that our students, many of them do have debt. They will have debt, right? <laughs> you know, um, that that's become the state of, of offering public education, you know, that we have a lot of students who will have debt. Um, and so so how do we support them to have the confidence, right, to, to stick with it, to complete, right, and to believe and to see that, that there's a, a college requiring job for them, right, that will allow them and allow our society really to, to be able to absorb the cost of, of education when it's not um, supported, right, for, for the families that, that we uh, serve, you know, at that level. So I think that that is really, really important um, to have those conversations um, in a way that builds confidence in the family and the student that they can accomplish the goal and that they can, um, you know, uh, figure out how to handle that that cost and that that cost will will return for them. So I think that that is a really important part of, of um, providing that fit, providing that comfort and that confidence to complete. So in my closing comments, I'm going to do something I rarely get to do, which is merge my researcher hat with my parent hat. <laughs> Um, and to note that we do this really weird thing in the K-12 space where we, um, we talk about careers and ex start to expose students to careers, usually in middle school. Um, at best, it's a thoughtful conversation. At worst, it's like click-through modules that doesn't mean much to them. <laughs> and then we put that aside because they get to high school and then we talk to them about college. And usually without revisiting conversations about careers and occupation and lifestyle that they want. 
And I think that that sets up a weird false dichotomy between college and career that sticks with them in unhealthy ways and really doesn't serve anybody as the dynamic is changing and as colleges are offering sort of different things. Um, you know, what we want is for students to oscillate back and forth between thinking about what they want to be when they grow up, what kinds of courses in high school they need, what kind of a college major might be useful, what kind of a lifestyle, you know, if you, if you take an interest inventory in seventh grade and it tells you, you should be a chef, and nobody tells you that chef hours are crap, you, you, you sort of go down a, a path without having full information. And, and if we would fix this in sort of the middle school, high school space, I think you might also see some more thoughtful things happening when students get to college. Most students change their major, and as they change their major and change their minds about what kinds of jobs they might want to um, you know, gun for uh, after, after investing in some sort of post-secondary um, education, we would also like them, for the benefit of having a good ROI, we would also like them to revisit the way that they have financed their college. If they went into college thinking they were going to major in computer science and have a tech job, and then they got to college and learned that their, their calling is toward teaching, that is a very different ROI, and they need to also revisit the way that they have chosen to finance college before they wind up um, you know, after college with some pretty substantial loans that would have been fine for a computer science major to handle and maybe not so much for a teacher. So my general thought is, again, going back into the K-12 space to fix a few of these things with an eye on people being more savvy once they get into the post-secondary space. Yeah, I spent a lot of time in forums talking about the future of work and education. And uh, every employer that I'm working with right now is trying to figure out how to do more skilling, upskilling, reskilling, mm -hmm. education, learning, whatever kind of sub bucket you want to put it into in the workplace. And every university I'm working with right now is trying to figure out how to do work integrated experiences for students. Mm -hmm. Where is this going, right? It's very clear to me that if you, if you kind of paint the ultimate vision here, it's um, sometime in the not too distant future it should be almost impossible for us to determine whether this is an educational institution or a workplace. Mm -hmm. Because there will be so much of a blend of both of those things happening that it'll be very difficult to tell the difference. And I'll just leave you a couple of interesting points, right? We, it's almost like we need to rediscover the learning value of work Today's 18 to 24 year olds, for example, are the least working generation in US history. Just let that sink in for a second. So how do we expect them to be work ready right. when they're the least working generation in US history? There's a big challenge there. But it's also rediscovering uh, and reinvesting on the employer front in the value of continuous learning on the job, right? Both of those things are so important for all of us, literally all of us, doesn't matter what level, what kind of position we're in, uh, that's the nature of where the world is spiraling. And so uh, the more that we can kind of, you know, edge towards that vision of, is this a university or a workplace? Is this a workplace or an educational institution? Uh, and I'm being a little provocative in that. I mean, obviously, we'll be able to tell. It'll say University of Arizona <laughs> when we drive into the gates or when we log onto the website. Uh, but my point here is that, you know, that's uh, very clearly where things are rapidly evolving from the perspective that I see. Great, thank you. Well, and interestingly, with this new class that came in, the, the largest class that we've ever had, there is a very large percentage of students who are undecided in their major and really trying to explore and figure out. I mean, we saw probably, a, I think it was a 40 some percent increase in the number of undecided students. And um, also seeing a change in how families are thinking about that where they are more allowing students to go in and explore a little bit and try to figure things out rather than saying, no, you need to go to business or you need to go to science. And so that's, that's been an interesting trend as well as students are really trying to figure that out and determine what they want to be um, because they haven't really gotten a chance to do that through high school in the same way as you were talking about, Jess. So we're welcoming that and encouraging um, students to be able to find that as well as enter into the programs that Abra spoke about so that we can really make sure that they are getting that ROI in the end and that we are serving them well. Well, I wanna thank you all so much for being a part of the panel today. You're excellent, your research, your thoughts, um, very much appreciated. And I know I learned a lot to help me in my position as well. So thank you so much and have a great day. Thank you.
can't move because we're, we're, we're trapped. Not. 